Good evening. The faithful few. It's a good evening, Miss Mandy. <laughs> um, welcome to the assembly, EVV. We are here to worship the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Herm. Um, just remember our offering is in the back. You can uh, put your tithes and offerings back there before you leave. And um, remember our pastors as they have a little getaway, a little rest. All right. So you're stuck with us tonight. <laughs> Um, let's just stand and pray and then just get right into worship. Amen? Amen. Lord, we thank you for tonight, God. We thank you that you hear us when we call. We thank you for your faithfulness. Lord, we just thank you, God, that you are here in this place tonight. Whatever we've been facing this week, God, we know that you've got it. You have it, Lord. We just have to speak your name, and it's gone. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, we've come together in your name, Jesus. We're here to lift you up, Jesus. We just pray, God, that your anointing would be in this place tonight, God, that you would open our ears and our hearts for what you would have for us, Lord, and we just pray, God, that you would bless this service. And we give you all the praise and all the glory. In your name we pray. Amen. Come, let us worship our King. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how his love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You flee every captive and break every chain, oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive, oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God, you have done great things. Hallelujah. You've been faithful.
just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind cause I know there's peace within your presence I speak Jesus I just want to speak the name of Jesus till every dark addition starts to break Shine through the shadows, burn light. 
of his name. Amen. No matter what you're facing, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Say the name. name tonight. Jesus. 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 We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus, for all you've done. We're so undeserving, Lord, but we thank you. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord. Thank you. 
you for your peace, for your comfort. We thank you for your love, Jesus. We thank you for your healing, Jesus. We thank you, we thank you, Lord. Jesus. We thank you that whatever we have need of, you've already provided. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you. Thank you for your presence, Lord. We just ask that you continue to be in this place, that you would anoint Sister Linda, God. Lord, that every word that would come from her mouth would be from you, Jesus. In the name of Jesus, we thank you for it. And we pray all this in your name. Amen. Good evening. You know, when I was looking up at this praise and worship team here, the Lord just reminded me that each one of them had been through tremendous storms, tremendous storms. And they stand up here as a testimony to the Lord that they are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. And they, they're just amazing. Just thank you for your time and your, your, your talent and being used of God like that and being faithful. Even in the midst of the storm, they could have said, quit, this isn't fair. But they had a made-up mind, as far as me and my house goes, we shall serve the Lord and we will honor the Lord. And that's what their lives have done. And it's a, it's a great testimony to this church and to the community. So we're so thankful for them. Uh, November 4th, in the small groups, at least for the rest of 2020, who knows after that, uh, the women will be meeting in here. The men will be meeting in the children's church. And for the women, we're going to at least discuss, I don't know how far we'll get, lies women believe and the truth that sets them free. So it'll be a wonderful discussion. Uh, Satan lies to all of us, I know, but... Um, there are some particular lies that he lies to women, and so we're going to have a discussion over that. And so I hope that you'll come to that and at least give it a try. The last time on a Wednesday night I spoke, it was on uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, and I only got through 12 verses. And so, uh, but it's, it's such a rich book. Um, so I'm going to finish chapter 1 uh, with beginning with verse 13, and try to complete it to halfway through chapter 2. I just love the Word of God. It's just um, it's so rich and so thankful that God left us a book to, to follow, a live book that speaks to us no matter what season in life that we're in. So what I'm going to do first is just read, beginning with chapter 1 of 1 Peter, and then we'll start breaking it down, in, beginning in verse 13. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bethnia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father and the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold, 
that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise and honor and glory of the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy, inexpressible and full of glory. Verse 9. Receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls, of this salvation the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who pro prophesied the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the suffering of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them it was revealed that not to themselves but to us, they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels desire to look into. And that's how far we got. So uh, beginning with verse 13 there, and I believe that most of this is either out of the New King James or the King James Version, says, Wherefore? Gird up the loins of your mind. Brace, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Um, I was trying to think that there was another translation. Ah, wherefore? Wherefore? Because of all this, because of what we read there in chapter 1, he says, I want you to gird up the loins of your mind because you have been sanctified, because you have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus, because he's given you a living hope, a new birth, an inheritance reserved for you because we are being kept by the power of God through faith. He said, I want you to gird up the loins of your mind, brace up your mind. How? It says there in verse 13, be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, the mind is not clear for battle. If our mind is full of uh, doubt, fear, anxiety, uh, full of negative unbelief, full of pride, then we're not ready for battle. Wherefore, because he's done all of this for us, gird up the loins of your mind, brace up your mind, prepare your minds for action, clear your minds. How many know that the battleground is the mind? And we have to clear our minds. I don't know about you, but I have to every day. Clear our minds for battle. We have to fight. And we can't fight if our minds are not clear of all the junk. We have to fight for our families. We have to fight for our religious rights. We have to fight for our community. We have to fight. And it's a real battle. It's like rolling up your sleeve and saying, let's get ready to rumble. Get ready to fight the good fight of faith. Lay aside every weight. Lay aside everything that you need to lay aside. Get out there and fight because of what Jesus has done. Because of what he has done. Gird it up. The biggest battleground is the mind. The body only sins after the mind sins. And the en enemy being spirit knows how to put thoughts into our minds. Thoughts of anxiety, thoughts of fear, thoughts of doubt, thoughts of worry. Thoughts of guilt. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 says, Though we live in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the tearing down of strongholds, bringing every thought to the captivity of Jesus Christ, casting down imagination and those things that stop you from having a better knowledge of God, getting rid of those things too. The Bible talks about having our loins girt about with truth. What is truth? The Word of God is the truth. 
And so it has to be poured in. We have to let the word of God pour in. That's why I'm so thankful that you came tonight because you came here to have the word of God poured into you. Let the word of God replace those doubts, those anxieties, those things that, that, that the enemy comes along and he tries to clutter our mind. He clutters our mind because if he can do that, then we're not ready for battle. And how many know he don't fight fair? So gird up the loins of your mind. And it says in verse 13, it tells us how. Be sober. And that means to be well balanced. It's the opposite of being drunk. Be sober in your thinking. Think straight. How many has ever had someone come up to you or maybe you said it to someone? Man, what were you thinking? <laughs> Anybody has got kids probably said that to their kids. What were you thinking when you did that? Man, that, that person wasn't thinking straight. What were you thinking? Be self-controlled. And then verse 13, not only are we to be sober, but he says, hope to the end. Keep on having hope. Keep on looking forward. The enemy would love it if you just lost your hope. Just lost your hope and gave up and quit. Then you have nothing to look forward to. And this Bible gives us a lot. He gives us a living hope. I, and I went over that teaching the last time about the living hope. Keep on having hope. Keep on looking forward. Philippians 3.13 says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth those things which are before, I press. How many know sometimes it's a pressing? I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of Jesus Christ. Keep on hoping till the end because God's grace is continuously, in verse 13, continuously being brought to you as Jesus continuously unveils himself. Our day-to-day -day walk is a constant unveiling of Jesus Christ. Our day-to-day -day battle of faith is a continuous unveiling of him of his majesty, of his power, of his glory, of his love. Keep on walking with him, and he will keep on unveiling himself to you. Keep on seeing him in a new and greater light. He's not playing peekaboo with us. He's not hiding. He loves to reveal himself to you. He loves to reveal himself through his word also, through a prayer life. So stop being anxious about anything. The Lord is near. As Paul says in Ephesians 2, 7, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding, exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Jesus Christ. That, I love that verse because what that tells me, Jesus is so good. He's such a good father that he is going to spend eternity showing us his kindness towards us. He don't need to do that. He's already done that. The kindness of the Lord that would be bruised and just, just tortured took my sin, my sin, and nailed it on the cross that I might have his life. Such an exchange. So he's already showed such exceedingly kindness towards us. So we keep on walking with him and he, and he will keep on unveiling himself to us. And that's what makes Christianity so exciting. He gives us these little glimpses. He gives us these little uh, new vision and just freshness of the Lord. He tastes and see that the Lord is good. He keeps on revealing new things about himself and about his word. And he keeps, it, it keeps Walking with him, exciting. I don't know about you, but I'm having a wonderful time serving the Lord. 44 years, I've never turned my back. And yes, there have been things that have happened that I wouldn't want to wish upon anybody. There have been things and trials that have happened that I don't ever want to repeat. But my God has been faithful and he's been good. And at the end of it all, at the end of it all, he still, he still has the last say so. He's always got to move. He's always got a plan. When you don't have a plan, he does. He does. So hang on. Now in verse 14, it says, As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust, 
as in your ignorance. In other words, before you were serving God, you lived according to your flesh. You didn't know any better. But he says, now you know better. Now you know better, so stop living that way. Don't live that way as a pattern of life. Because we have the Spirit of God dwelling on the inside of us to show us. We have the Word of God that instructs us, that tells us how to live. We have a new nature. And the Holy Spirit is trying to teach us how to walk in that new nature, the new nature of Jesus Christ. And so we don't have to let our flesh just, just dictate to us of what we should or shouldn't do. 2 Timothy 2.15 in the Phillips translation says, For yourself, concentrate on winning God's approval, on being a workman with nothing to be ashamed of, and who knows how to use the word of truth to the best advantage. We have an advantage. His Holy Spirit, His word. What an advantage we have today. You know how God wants you to live. And to him, much is given, much is required. We've been given an abundant life. We've been given the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit living down on the inside. We've been given full pardon, full pardon, and inheritance. We've been given wisdom. We've been given grace. We've been given mercy. We've been given power. We've been given authority. To much is given, much is required. In verse 15, but as he who has called you is holy, you also be holy in all of your conduct. Now, I don't read anything in here that talks about the length of your hair or whether you should come in with a dress or jeans or a pair of pants. Holiness is a condition of the heart that's produced by the Holy Spirit. Holiness is not external legalism. Holiness is something that happens from the inside out, not from the outside in. The word be holy means to become holy. In other words, we haven't arrived yet because he says he is holy, you be holy. It's a lifetime goal, isn't it? Every day is a lifetime goal. Be ye holy. Keep on becoming like him. And that is a lifetime goal. So you know what? Sometimes we got to be patient with ourselves because we haven't made it yet. It's a lifetime goal to become like he is. We, we will be like him when? When we see him face to face. When we see him as he is. Not these external things that people define as holiness. Now in God's sight, you're already holy. You are separate. Put that into practice in your life, becoming holy. Become what God is, walking in the Spirit. Become of His nature. Become of His compassion. Become of His love, His purity. Become partakers of the divine nature. Become what He is, not these external things that people define as holiness. Become holy in all manner of conversation. Let everything you do be holy, be a way of life. Is what you're doing pleasing to God? Is it bringing reproach to his name or is it bringing glory to him? Is people, when they look at you, do they say, if that's what a Christian is, I want that. I see the joy in their lives. I see the love. I see them going through a storm and yet they're worshiping God. How is that happening? I see something different about them. I see that they have something that I don't have. Verse 16. It says, because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. That's future tense. It's be, be ye becoming holy. Keep it up. <clears throat> keep it up. Keep it up. Don't give up. Don't quit. If you fall, guess what? Get back up. Listen, God's not there with a baseball bat ready to clobber you. He's there to pick you up. He's there to dust you off, say, take me by the hand, and let's try this again. Keep on becoming what he is because it's going to be worth it all when we see him face to face. Verse 17. And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourself throughout the time of your sojourning here in fear. So what he's saying here, call on your Father for your own benefit 
who is without respect or a person keeps on judging. And he's talking to Christians here. God keeps on judging you. How? It says so there in verse 17, according to every man's work. Bible is clear that you are not saved by your works, but your works demonstrate that you're saved. Your works show. Faith without works is dead. Not only that, but Christians are going to answer in the presence of God for their works at the judgment seat of Christ. Now, don't misunderstand me. You won't answer for any sin. A lot of people get that a little confused. There is no sin at the judgment seat of Christ. Your sins have been washed away by the blood of Jesus. He says never to be brought up again. Your sin is thrown in a sea of forgetfulness. I don't know about you, but that's just some shouting ground right there. It is for me. It says in uh, first, or 2 Corinthians 5.10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. 1 Corinthians 3, 11 through 15 says, For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Christ Jesus. If any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, and costly, costly stones, wood, hay, and straw, his work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives... He will receive his reward. If it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. Now it says in verse 17, pass the time in your sojourning here in fear. Sojourning means to dwell temporarily. He's saying, of course, and you know, I've, I've said this, taught this before, that this is not our home. We're just passing through. This is just a, you know how those forms you get once in a while, it says, is this your permanent residence or is this your temporary residence? I always want to put, this is my temporary residence. <laughs> I'm not here to stay. I, I'm, I'm going home someday to my permanent residence. So he's saying, spend your time here living in fear or in awesome respect. Doesn't the Bible say perfect love cast out fear, but yet he says that we, uh, we still have to fear God? Perfect love casts out terror, but the fear of God is his total respect and awe and over who and, and what he is. We don't treat God casually. We don't treat God casually. The world might treat God casually if they treat him at all, but we don't treat God casually. And I think that for myself, it's a good reminder not to do that, to treat him casually. We should not assume that our privileged status as God's children uh, gives us the freedom to do whatever we want because it doesn't. We should not be as spoilt children, but grateful children who love to show respect to our Heavenly Father. Now, I'm preaching to the choir tonight because this is a Wednesday night crowd. And if you treated God casually, I don't think you'd be here, but you're here. We have to show total respect and awe of who he is. Now, spend your time living here. And believe me, it's just such a short time. And the older I get, the more I realize what short time we have to spend it in total respect of who and what God is. Because you don't get to do do-overs. Verse 18 and 19. It says, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold from your vain conversation, received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. The word conversation there means your manner of living. So he's saying, your empty manner of living received by the traditions from your father. So we are redeemed from the useless and fruitless way of living received from the traditions of our father. Religious institutions today are full of traditions that have nothing to do with the word of God. It's just religion without power. God forbid that we would ever 
ever become like that. And Paul warns that the traditions of men in the book of Colossians 2.8, it says, see to it that no one carries you off as spoils or make yourself captive by his so-called philosophy. How many know there's a lot of philosophy going on? And intellectualism and vain deceit following human traditions, men's idea of material rather than spiritual world just crude notions following the rudimentary and elementary teachings of the universe and disregarding the teachings of Christ the Messiah. Now, I find that very interesting. Here, this word was written over 2,000 years ago, and he's saying, don't let someone carry you off with the elementary teachings of the universe. How many has heard over the years? Oh, the universe. (laughs) The universe is for me. The universe is against me. The universe. (laughs) Really? Okay, I'll get back on here. I'll behave. (laughs) Can anyone think of some traditions passed down from your fathers? I can think of a lot of them. I can think of uh, having to go to confession to a priest. I couldn't go to God myself. I had to go to a priest every Saturday to confession. If I didn't have a confession, I made up something. That way I had something for the following Saturday. It was a ridiculous thing, but that's what I did. I can think of some traditions such as having to eat fish sticks on Friday nights instead of a good old hamburger. I can think of putting Christopher, wearing Christopher, the the metal Christopher for years because it was Christopher would protect me had nothing to do with the Word of God, had nothing to do with Jesus, or putting a a statue in your car for protection. These are traditions, traditions of men. And I could go on. Uh, Being baptized as a baby, members of my church, or you're not saved. All, All kinds of things. And the Bible talks about vain traditions, and most traditions are vain. They're empty. And in verse 19, he says, But with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Jesus said, which of you can accuse me of sin? The prince of this world comes and he cannot find anything in me. In verse 20, he says, he indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Before God ever created the universe, before he ever put Adam and Eve in the garden, He knew that he was going to create you, and he knew he was going to have to suffer, but he did it anyway. Can you imagine God creating us, knowing what he was going to have to do, and yet he did it? That's the kind of love that the Father has for you. Our behavior did not take him by surprise. He said, I want someone to love me, and I'm going to give him life, and yes, I know I'm going to have to suffer but I'm going to do it anyway. What amazing father that we serve. I can't grasp that kind of love. When I start thinking about the love of the God for me and his amazing grace, it boggles my mind. It blows my fuse. Verse 21 says, who through him believed in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and your hope is in God. Our confidence is in him through Jesus Christ. It certainly is in me. I can't save myself. Apart from him, I can do nothing. But he, he raised him from the dead. He completed the work and gave him glory so that we can have our faith and our hope in him. He did the whole thing. What amazing father. What amazing father. Verse 22, since you, have been pure, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit and unfeigned love for, of the brethren, see that you love one another fervently with a pure heart. Wow, I started thinking about that and how the Father has a pure heart. His love for you and for me is with a pure heart, fervently. His love for us is fervently. And so he says, because I've loved you that way, I want you to love the brethren that way too. The word fervently means red hot, boiling over with holy enthusiasm. 
Can you believe that? The Father, love for you is red hot, boiling over in holy enthusiasm for you. For you. You are of such great value to him. Don't you ever doubt it. Don't let the enemy lie to you and make you feel like, like you're nobody. Because in God, if you were the only one on this earth, he would have died. He would have done the same thing just for you. He would have done it. Now, he says, I want you with fervency, with a pure heart to love the brethren. Is that always easy to do? The brethren can be pretty unlovable sometimes, can't they? Sometimes loving the brethren means doing something that you don't want to, like biting your tongue when you don't want to. It's the seeing there that you have purified your souls. How? In obeying the truth. And that's tough sometimes, in obeying the truth. God's word said it. Well, I don't feel like it. But God's word said it, and I'm going to do it. Here. Matthew 5.39, whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn to the other cheek. How many feel like doing that? You'll find out real quick if your flesh is alive or not. Most of us, if we get slapped in the cheek, guess what? We roll up our sleeve in a different kind of fight, don't we? That's why he says we don't fight against flesh and blood. What about this one in verse 40 in Matthew 5? For anyone who wants to see you and take away your, or sue you and take away your tonic, you make sure and give them your coat too. I'm thinking to myself, that ain't going to happen. <laughs> but God's word says. What about verse 44? Love your enemy and bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Well, I don't feel like doing that. God says, bless them anyway. You know, God's not going to bless sin. So if you pray for your enemy, God bless them. That means he's going to have to deal with them because he's not going to bless sin. He's going to have to deal with them and put them in right relationship with them so that they can be blessed. But guess what? By you blessing your enemy, you praying over your enemy blesses you. God says, I see that you're doing my word and I'm going to bless you for it. You're building your, you're building your treasures in heaven. Now, is that always easy to do? It's taken me a long time. I finally, in there, I can bless my enemies. But it's amazing to me, though, how, how when we have a close relationship with Jesus, the closer we walk with him, how, how that straightens out, how all of a sudden we have love for our enemies. I remember when I first got saved and filled with the Holy Ghost three days later, I just, I just, I went around saying, man, I just love you. I acted like a maniac. I just love you. I just love my enemies. I didn't have an enemy, but I loved them anyway. I didn't know. It was just this bubbly love, this agape love that's, that's in your heart that comes pouring out. He says, I come to give you abundant life and out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Well, what do you think that living water is made out of? His love. And so as you walk close to him, that love comes back and all of a sudden, you know, love, love uh, doesn't keep score. All of a sudden, you're not keeping score anymore. Well, you did that. That's the third time you did. Strike three. You are out. No, that's not our father. I got to land here somewhere. Where am I? Through the spirit unto unfeigned love. Unfeigned means don't just put it on. Well, I love you because the Bible says I got to love you, but I don't like you. That's baloney. <laughs> you can't love somebody you don't like. How many heard that? Well, I have to love you because the Bible says so, but I don't like you. Liar. <laughs> it means unfeigned means genuine, sincere, true. Peter's talking especially about loving your brothers and sisters in Christ here, not the unsaved. He's saying, don't just put on that you love other Christians, but let that love be real, not phony love or pretense. It comes from the heart. It's sometimes harder to love the brethren than the unsaved because the unsaved have an excuse. The brethren don't. As we draw close to God, he puts that love in your heart for one another. He really does. Verse 23 through 25. Gosh, this time is just crazy. 
having been born again, not a corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever because all flesh is as grass and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass, the grass withers and it flowers fall away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. So what he's saying here is if you've been born of the flesh, you're going to wither like the flower. But if you've been born by the word of God, then the word of the Lord's going to last forever. And he says, you will too, everlasting life. Okay, five more minutes. We're going to start in chapter two. <laughs> Obviously, we're not going to get very far. That's okay. Chapter two, Peter begins to meddle with our lives. Oh, you, you, you thought he'd already meddled in your life? No, no, no. Chapter two, he gives five things he wants us to lay aside. He says, I want you to lay these five things aside because it's for your own benefit, uh, to show Christian character here. So he says, therefore, lay aside, number one, all malice, which means deceit. It means troublemaker. Lay aside troublemaker. You know, it seems to me everybody has someone in their family, a member of their family, a relative of their family, or maybe somebody, a co-worker, that just loves to come in and stir the pot. And then they leave with you, the mess. He says, lay it aside. Number two, and all guile. And the word means with bait. In other words, don't be watching for them to do something wrong so, just so you can pounce on them. Aha! I knew you'd mess up sooner or later. Aha! You think you're so much better than me. That's guile. Self-appointed fault finders. I don't think God's ever given that gift out to anybody, do you? Number three, hypocrisy, acting. Lay aside acting and be real. Be who you are. Don't wear a mask. God sees behind the mask. Now, don't leave and say, Linda said, don't wear a mask. <laughs> I'll get in trouble. <laughs> In other words, don't come to church and be one way and then you go home and be another or go to work and, you're, you, and they don't even know. They don't even know you're a Christian. You're, you're someone different. It's like being a chameleon. You know, you change colors to whatever crowd you're with. He says, just be real. Just be who you are. Number four, envies, which is jealousy and grudges. Some hold perpetual grudges against another. Number five, all evil speaking. And that is speaking against your brother or sister with backbiting and murmuring, defaming their character. It's assassination by words, evil speaking. And then verse 2, oh gosh, there's so much. Desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Be like babes and desire the pure milk of the word. And that means the pure word. It means not mixed with impurities. Every false cult has to have some other book, some other tradition, some other dream or vision, some other revelation to establish their doctrine. Beware of anyone who criticizes you for going to the Word of God to find an answer for what you do and what you believe. The Word is what's going to cause you to grow. Not someone's dream, not someone's vision, or their, their doctrine, or their tradition, but this Word. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious, verse 3, the Lord is good. Coming to him as a living stone, rejected or disallowed indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. So he is a living stone, disallowed indeed by men. Disallowed means to cast on a rubbish heap as useless and worthless. And that is pretty much what the world has done with God. That's what he's done with our Messiah. They have cast him uh, upon a rubbish heap as worthless and not relevant for today. The world says, well, this is 2020. We don't need God. The book of Judges says they do that which is right in their own eyes. We don't need God. 
but it says chosen of God and precious in verse 4. Peter likes that word precious, and the word precious means so precious that you cannot put a price tag on it. So, so precious. Verse 5, you also are living stones. So he's saying here, Jesus is a living stone, but he says through Jesus, you are living stones too. Ephesians 2.20, Paul says that we are built upon the foundations of apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. 1 Corinthians 3.10, I'm going to wrap it up here. Let every man take heed how he builds thereon. So we are living stones. And Peter says in verse 5, we are being built up a spiritual house or a spiritual abiding place for God. You are the temple of God. Paul says in Corinthians, know you not that you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you. And he says in verse 5, you are a holy priesthood. Now, Revelation 1, 6 says that he has made us a kingdom of priests unto God. What is the responsibility of a priesthood? Verse 5 says there, to offer up spiritual sacrifice acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. So what kind of spiritual sacrifices does God want from us? He wants that praise that comes from the heart. Therefore, it is also contained in the scripture, verse 6, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect and precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. So they put him aside, cast him on the rubbish heap. But God raised him up on the third day after his death. And raised him up to be the head of the corner. Christ is the cornerstone on which the spiritual building rests. And which the building is held together. He is the cornerstone of our faith. And verse 8 says, in a stone of stumbling. Actually, the stone of stumbling is a small, loose stone in the pathway. And a rock of offense. That rock is Petra, a big boulder, a foundation stone. Even to them which stumble at the word. Jesus is either a stepping stone or he's a stumbling block. He'll either, he'll either be a stepping stone to glory or a stepping, or I'm sorry, a stumbling block to hell. Jesus was a stumbling block to the Jews. 1 Corinthians 1.22 says, For the Jews required a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. The Jews wanted a Messiah to set up their kingdom here and to drive out the Romans. But Jesus died on the cross, and so he became a stumbling block to them. And the phrase rock of offense, the word offense is the Greek word scandalons, where we get our English word scandal from. Jesus is a scandal to some people because they stumbled at the word. Why? Because they were disobedient. They did not want anything to do with God, so they, be, they stumbled at his word. And the last part of verse 8 says, whereunto also they were appointed. Now, they were not appointed to be disobedient, but they were already stumbling because they refused to believe in the Word of God. They didn't want to have anything to do with God. They were not appointed for disbelief, but because they disbelieved, they were appointed to stumble. And the last verse there, but you are a chosen generation. He says, you're not like this. You're not like someone who pushes Jesus off into the heap and say, I don't want to have anything to do with you. He says that you are a chosen generation. And that means that you are an elect race, but not just any elect race. No, that word means you are a whole new race. Luke's gospel shows that Jesus came to the last Adam. He did not fail where the first Adam failed. And he be, he, because he did not fail, he was able to start a whole new race of people 
who have been born again by the Spirit of God, a royal priesthood. Now, under the law, there was only a priest, only one priesthood that was the Aram, the, I'm sorry, Aaronic priesthood and the Levites, but they were not royalty. The priests of the Old Testament were not royalty. They were descendants of Levi. The royal line was Judah. You could not be from Judah and be a priest. There was only one royal priest in the Old Testament, and that was Melchizedek. And his name means king of righteousness and king of peace. Abraham met him after slaughtering kings, and he gave Melchizedek a tenth of his spoil. In other words, he tithed to him. But the book of Hebrews says that, Jesus, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Jesus is a royal priest. He is the line of the tribe of Judah. He is the king of kings and lord of lords. He is our great high priest. And in Jesus Christ, you and I are royal priests. But we're not just royal priests. We are family. And we come into the presence of God to uh, offer up spiritual sacrifices of praise and worship and adoration to him. And he says, you are, in verse 9, a holy nation, a peculiar people. So you're separate. We don't live the way that the world lives. Peculiar people. Now, peculiar people doesn't mean strange, even though I know the world thinks that we're pretty strange. But that word there means you particularly belong to him. It could be translated God's special treasures. That's who you are to him. We are God's inheritance to show forth praises of him who has called you out of darkness into marvelous light. Into his marvelous light. I'm going to stop right there. Marvelous means causing great wonder, extraordinary, astounding. He says, I've delivered you from walking in darkness, and I've put you into this astounding, extraordinary light to walk in. And he is extraordinary, isn't he? I've gone way past my time. Thank you so much for being so patient. Stand. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You are extraordinary. You are our light. You are our everything. You are the very breath that we breathe. Father, you did the whole thing. We thank you for your blood that cleanses us from all sin. We thank you for a living hope. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that guides us and directs our pathway. We thank you for the fruit of the Spirit being developed in us. We thank you for your long-suffering, your gentleness, your kindness, your patience. Father, I speak a blessing on each one here tonight. Bless them, bless their homes. Lord, I pray that you would just create such a hunger in their hearts for your sincere word, your pure word. Begin to show yourself in a mighty way, oh God, I pray in the name of Jesus.